championship means everything in regards to redemption for myself, my team, and my region. It's been a long time since North America proved they can be the best, and I'm hoping my team is the team that can change that. And we're back, I'm Cloakin, and we are two series in on Group C here for the HGC 2017. Fantastic matches, three games each as well, as we saw Roll20 take a 2-1 victory over Red Cannons, and then just wrapped up Team Dignitas, 2-1 victory over Korea's Tempest. It was a fantastic match. You should go back and watch it if you missed it. But up next, the winner's matchup, this one, NA versus EU. This one's for you, Reddit. Who's gonna take the first seat out of Group C for BlizzCon? You're gonna wanna stick around to find out. Let's head over to our regionally diverse panel with the non-biased Brit himself at the helm, Kai Laris. Thank you very much, Kevin, for that lovely call out. I appreciate it all the same <laughs> as we do get into this. Of course, Dignitas, some of my boys over there are going to be going up against Roll20. And not only is there the potential to be able to advance onto BlizzCon, advance onto the round of eight, as Cloaker mentioned, EU versus North American Pride, and also North America still looking for a big win over a European team, Gilly. Yeah, don't worry, I'll balance you out here on this side of the desk. I got you, fam. Yeah, Rule 20 thinks that they can do it. They, I talked to Glowering this morning, and even though they lost the initial game, they're all warmed up and ready to go. They yeah. were able to defeat Red Cannons, and they're looking to be the team that does represent North America well and does get a victory, a major victory, over an European team. Uh, for me, I think that this is going to be pretty clean and dry. I saw... Tempest, sure, they played pretty poorly, especially in game number three. I was really disappointed with their performance overall, especially after such great games in game number one and number two. The Dragonshire game, really intelligent play from Dignitas. I was talking to Grubby about this backstage. It looked like Dignitas prepared every single piece of that draft. Everything was locked in very quickly. I think Dignitas' preparation is top tier out of the four teams in this group, and I think they should be able to take this with a 2-0. Uh, I'll check in with you in a second, Grubby, as, of course, we need to take a look at the bracket and uh, see exactly how things have gone down so far as we have Roll20 and Team Dignitas being able to steam on forwards into the winner's match so they have an opportunity to claim a round of eight spot. Meanwhile, down to the bottom, later on, we're going to have Red Canids going up against Tempest. But, Grubby, moving things and shifting things back to where we are, were before Roll20 Esports going up against Team Dignitas. What are your initial overview thoughts going into it? Well, first of all, Roll20 has not tasted the bitter taste of defeat for a very long time now. Uh, they came off the back of a, an NAHCC season with seven consecutive victories. Now, defeating Red Canids. Losing a battleground is one thing, but an entire series would be quite another. So, if anything, this is going to be a really tough benchmark to see how the team sticks together if they end up losing, or maybe their 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 string of triumphs will proceed. All right. Well, let's focus firstly on Team Dignitas here coming into this series, as they have just come off the back of defeating Korea to start things off. So Gillyweed, looking at that series, you know, being able to really kind of go through it with a fine tooth comb. How do you see Dignitas's prospect uh, going into this series? I love what Dignitas is doing with early structural damage. They're trying to get a keep down as fast as they possibly can and then playing with their food, playing with that, uh, with vision and trying to force their opponents to play scared from that moment on while mm. they do what they need to do to work themselves into a victory. And I don't know if Roll20 is ready for that. Tempest didn't seem ready for that, although they did they were able to come back on the first game and be able to get a victory from that, but it is a pretty terrifying uh, prospect to know that a team is that aggressive early on. Right, they didn't throw the dice and see how will the team fight end up. Dignitas, the very essence of their play tasted completely different from every match we've seen so far of the BlizzCon opening week. Yeah. Uh, they yeah. disengaged from any fight that doesn't spell uh, a really good outcome. Uh, giving up the curse 
on Cursed Hollow just now. Mm. Giving up the boss. These are things that look like a mistake. Oh, it was stolen from her. No, exactly what they wanted. They yeah. played it safe. They just pulled back whenever needed. Very clean, very calculated. This team is so well prepared. They have drafts set up for this, as Gilly was talking about, getting the early keep having that catapult pressure to control vision, to, get, to be able to threaten core calls and things like that, that Dignitas has been known for, the European region has been known for that late game prowess that comes from an early lead. I think it's almost, you can call it idealistic, the way that Dignitas plays. They only look for the ideal situation, and if it doesn't suit every checkbox that they're marking, they just walk away, and they have that lead, so they have that fallback. And of course, our second team here going into it, of course, Roll20 Esports, uh, who had a bit of a rocky road there against Red Canid, something that we didn't expect coming in, but they're still a ferocious opponent, especially when it comes to the North American standings. Yeah, Pr Prismaticism said that they weren't quite warmed up yet, and mm. I would say they definitely underestimated the members of Red Cannons. Yeah. Granted, it was probably a fair underestimation to have. Red Cannons had two subs, but Red Cannons in their regional, to me, seemed the strongest Latin, Latin America has ever looked in Heroes of the Storm, and even with the world-class players that they were able to get as subs, still very good. And after they realized how good Red Cannons were, Rule 20 ad adapted to make sure that they were still dominant in the next two games. Yeah, I, I think that uh, it was adaptation coming out from Rule 20, I wonder what they'll try to bring in here if things go sour on the first map because we saw them pull out on Tomb when Tomb was chosen against them, that Chromie. Uh, we saw the Medivh on Infernal Shrine. So they've kind of already shown their hand and that was something we were talking about in the desk here last time uh, they played in that first match of the evening. So what they do now if they fall behind in the map, will this strategy be used again? I think Dignitas has plenty of time to repair. It seems a little bit predictable. That's what I'm worried about for them. One thing that I don't think we'll see too readily, Wolf, is like Medivh first pick. This yeah. seems to be, yeah. I think, a hero, uh, the kind of one-trick quality that by now people have come to expect from World 20 with such an excellent Medivh like Glaurung. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to see more like really foundationally good strategies that don't rely on such an off-meta pick in the first slot. But who knows? Okay, let's find out which bra battleground we're going to be going to here for our first game in this winner's match. Roll20 picks Infernal Shrines to start things off, Gillyweed. Uh, one thing I want to add to that is that uh, as a person who commentates Roll20 a lot, I don't feel like they've shown anything. They've shown that much. Okay. Maybe the most that they've shown is that Glaurung is fully on a secondary support role. But even that might shift later on. But otherwise, everything that they picked, everything they've done is yeah. something that they have picked and prioritized in the past. You say this, uh, but uh, on the other side, do you think Dignitas is also kind of on that spot where they were picking the Tassadar Tracer against a team like Tempest? Because if they didn't, Tempest was going to take it. And But Dignitas is also well versed with it. I do, I do think that's a part of it as well. Uh, oh. I, I, usually a team like Dignitas with realistic ambitions for number one spot I think they're going to have a lot of standard metas that do work really well. Uh, they're not going to suffer from things like, let's play our standard without showing anything special and okay. then accidentally lose, like Roll20 kind of did against right. Red Cannons. All right, going into game number one here, the draft begins. The winner of this best of three moves on to the BlizzCon round of eight. And if you wanted to first pick a Medivh, unfortunately, it's not going to be the case now. Yeah. <laughs> Dignitas plays uh, versus Expert a lot, and it's sort of the same kind of drafting style yeah. versus that. ADRD often plays either Tassadar, Abathur, Ooh. or Medivh. And here, they're taking Medivh, or they ban Medivh, and then they take Abathur. So it's kind of like or drafting versus Team Expert. I think what Dignitas is going to look to do in this series is to win the macro game, whether it's with uh, solo uh, DPS or double DPS, the false dead stuff we've seen from uh, Fnatic already, Dignitas a little bit as well. I think that's going to be what they try to approach. Roll20 runs top tier solo lane heroes like the Sonya in their drafts. They do draft those types of heroes, but they don't often play around them. We saw them running uh, on Sky Temple, glowering in the top lane on Malfurion, for example. So they never really have lane pressure. Dignitas is going to look to use lane pressure to get those early keeps like you were talking about, Gilly. So I think that's the kind of drafting we can expect uh, from the European side of things here. I am very interested in a draft speed analysis mm -hmm. by the end of BlizzCon because <laughs> yes. Dignitas has been kicking it out of the park with the speed of their picks. Let's see how many seconds it takes for their second and third pick to come out here. Brightwing and Uther by Roll20. And what's also cool is that Dignitas first banned Abathur three times in a row against Tempest just now. And yeah. then goes to pick it here, showing a very 
complete uh, yeah, storehouse of strategies against different teams. So it feels like Roll20 Esports is actually, with those picks, focusing Bakery pretty heavily. If, if you think about the position that they're currently in, but the thing is, is that they only have one ban left, and is it, even if it's Karazine or Morales, he can go to the other one if he wants. Well, one thing that Uther Brightwing right. accomplishes outside of isolation of mm. a single support, it's they're the two heroes that are best at shutting down melee assassins, yep. like Tracer, Illidan, Zeratul, whatever. Uh, and so you, it both enables it for Roll20 to run something like that, yep. as well as shutting it down from Dignitas. And because Dignitas already has Abathur, that is also enabled on their side. So right. I do think it's two smart support picks. Yeah, especially seeing that Abathur pick. But Greymane is still a really good addition with an Abathur and Rhaegar, um, making sure that they have both good Shrine Clear and they still have somebody who works well with the Abathur. Uh, they have a clone. He gets the bonus from Curse of the Worgen. But now seeing an Arthas ban, that's, so they don't want to give another synergy to Abathur. That's as well also, as the clear. yeah, I feel like that's a little bit suspicious that Abathur ban. I think you look to the you Sonya mean the ban. ban oh, sorry, right? yeah, sorry, the Arthas ban. I think maybe you look towards the Sonya ban here. If you're Dignitas, take that away. It's one of their go tos. Looking at the Genji here, actually, well, instead. Let's talk about what Arthas represents. Arthas counters Greymane well, showing that Roll20 doesn't want to go down that route. He also counters heroes that haven't been picked yet, but are enabled by Roll20, such as Illidan. Yeah, Illidan, uh, Genji is also uh, one of the heroes that would be negatively affected by this, and the Sonya. Uh, not as much, but definitely in a much. similar vein. She's still melee, right? Yeah, yeah. in a similar vein, so. I wonder I, if Roll20 will go that Illidan route. It's, it's definitely a possibility, and it's tough to counter for Dignitas with what they have left to choose. And, you know, it would be a surprising pick, but Roll20 has just shown us nothing but diversity in drafts and moving into their comfort picks and their own style uh, when down. Of course, this is just game number one. Yeah, uh -huh. It's going to be the Sonya, though. And Diablo. And Diablo. So we haven't seen a lot of Diablo this tournament at all yet, if at all. Is that the first Diablo, first Diablo pick? The first. He was banned already once by Red Cannons, but this will be the first time he's locked in. Cool. What I am enjoying, enjoying from Roll20 is Justing's play. He had a lot of control over the warrior player of Red Cannons with his Garrosh always dictating when they got to engage, and really that was never because he was always forcing these defensive power slides. He can do the same thing with his Diablo, throwing people around, making them be less than ideal setups so that he gets space for Sonya to be able to clear out the shrine. Yeah, it's very strong obviously on this map because there's so many walls, there's so much terrain to charge targets into. And devils do. Yeah, and you have the ability to just simply use APOC defensively when you've got a Greymane or a Greymane clones and the Abathur hat. Even a Rhaegar clone sure it could be that is the way that Dignitas goes about this. But I like this is a defensive play. Okay, so with this Dignitas have the option to just completely play outside of the objective. Uh, you're against Emerald Wind, Apocalypse, a lot of zone control and you've got Abathur, Greymane, Rhaegar. Amazing at split pushing. I'm expecting a very brainy brand of Heroes of the Storm play. Leoric leads even more credence to that. And so uh, Dignitas is probably going to do a lot of objective skipping. Yeah, running around it. Again, going back to that macro play we were talking about, uh, we saw Rule 20 uh, play similarly to this with the Grey Main on this map when they were facing off against Red Cannon, just kind of avoiding the, uh, the, the objective itself, right? the shrine when possible. So, question is now, what's the DPS here for roll 20 gray main? Or sorry, Genji would be fantastic here, but obviously removed, so... And, and you need to stop that split push, so who's good at defending and offlane? That's gonna be Gul'dan. Yeah. He's a great defender, he's not very mobile, but he is very good from behind the tower, behind the gate, to stop multiple attackers. I do kind of like that. That's also the first Gul'dan of the tournament, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Mm. I was considering, you know, the Gul'dan in uh, the first series of the night, on a similar draft as it's so strong on this map. That was with the battery though, with the Ariel. So now that you've got this cooldown, you have a lot of disruption. You have this, again, defensive tool, like we were talking about, the Horrify. You've got Diablo, yeah. you can Horrify, then Apoc. It's very difficult to actually hard engage with the Grey May and Abathur composition they're up against. A lot of control. Feels like the one thing that Roll20 has to be careful of is Leoric flanks, surely, for something like a Gul'dan comp to stay alive and get good to go. Is that fair? Yeah, but Horrify will be useful in mm -hmm. that regard, too. If he gets around the wrong side and there is a good Entomb, then Horrify, if people funnel into the Entomb trying to catch whoever's in there, can space them back out long enough for them to be able to get out or at least make it through it. 
I would still put it on Dignitas just because of the caliber of team they are. They are extremely strong, extremely skilled. But this is a Roll20 draft, and I think coming in with Roll20 drafts is a way that Roll20 defeats Dignitas. Grubby? I Both think fun. straight up in team fight, Roll20 has the much better team fight. Any even fight is going to want to be avoided by Dignitas. But I think Dignitas has better map control, and I do okay. think they can use that for a victory. Well, we're ready to go over to the commentary team here as we do begin this first game here to determine who moves on to BlizzCon. Let's over to the commentary team as we go on to Infernal Shrines. Thank you very much, Kalaris. And we are ready for our winner's match in the first map here with Europe going up against North America once again. I'm excited to see it. You know, Roll20 was very, very dominant within North America, but the ultimate goal has been international performance, and this is the perfect time for them to be able to step it up and show that it's more than just words here. Yeah, and we've been talking quite a bit about the draft as well. A couple of choices that were really interesting, especially the lack of material on Dignitas' side was a bit confusing at first. Yeah, we thought that there was going to be kind of more focus on the AoE supporting and team fighting coming out for them, but ultimately the goal did Dan, I think, is the big wild card yeah, for me exactly. here from Team Digni or excuse me, from the members of Roll20. Not the hyper carry, you know, you typically exactly. see into that slot. Yeah, but we are going to head into the game and we'll find out what exactly Roll20 has planned here for the game and, of course, Dignitas as well. Our first map, Infernal Shrines, as we get ready to see this Clash of the Titans in Group C. It is going to be awesome here as we are ready for it once again, as you said. You know, it's apparently the longest loading screen we've had all tournament. <laughs> <laughs> and over to the left side now, we have Team Dignitas with Bakery on Rega, JPL on ETC for that frontline. Mena today on Abathur playing the Slugger here, Snitch on Greymane, and we have Zelia playing Leoric. And Roll20 here in the red, we are going to have Glorong on his Brightwing, Justing on the front line on that Diablo. Goku on Sonya, Prismaticism on that Gul'dan, and last is Buds on Uther. I'm not gonna lie, I am hyped for this series. Glorong has oozed confidence throughout the entire last few days that we had here. They've been extremely secretive about their strategies. They've been saying from the start, you know what? We'll get out of this group number one. Yeah, no, they... no questions asked. I asked him this morning, is that like, no doubt in my mind. We are the number one. I think giddy is the word that comes to mind when I, yeah. I what Glorong kind of just his aura of like he's just so eager to be able to perform. And again, as I said before, it is time for the words to kind of whittle away here and, and make it into actual action. Yeah, and a lot of the European teams were doubting themselves a bit after they went to Korea and were saying, okay, how good are we? Are we really on that high level where we wanted to be? Do we trade into the Koreans as well as we thought we would? And especially when we talk about Dignitas, they have felt a lot better just oh. recently. But look at that, Dignitas with the aggression in the early game and Glorung once again, as in the previous series, barely getting out on Brightwing. Yeah, the magic damage being used there was the only reason he was able to survive that one. But quickly, Glorong just teleports right on back here. A 2-1-2 two, two is the laning situation here for Roll20. That is something that is almost never performed in the North American scene. So already we can kind of see the adjustments that they are bringing at the international stage. Heavy pressure at the top lane in the meantime, though. Dignitas with three, man. They want to go for the kill. They go for Goku and they get it. They take the wall and they get first blood as Sonya falls. Yeah, that is now immediately you got to be looking. Well, row 20, what were they able to make happen on the other side of the map? Zalia is still fine and very comfortable, but at least we see Prismaticism and Buds trying to get that damage onto the front wall and securing at least one turret. And I mean, Tignadas, of course, completely realizing that with Greymane, they have a perfect tool to burst through these structures, and they're trying to make it the best out of it. It's also one of the reasons why we even expected to an extent either a ban or an early pickup on the side of Roll20 on Greymane, just to deny to Dignitas after they showed with the early Abathur what they are trying to do here. So at this point, we are probably going to see that Poppy on Greymane later on in the game after level 10. And it's going to be interesting to see how Roll20 deals with that. Yeah, and with the, an analyst desk was talking about the macro and map control that the Leoric and the Abathur, the Rhaegar yeah. are going to be able to provide here. And the first shrine phase is, I feel like, really going to highlight the strengths that this composition has here. The Sonya, one of the best wave players for the members of Roll20, but about, other than Gul'dan, the only wave player that they have, and he is stuck in that bottom lane applying pressure. So Dig has a very strong advantage on this shrine. And Abathor, of course, always going to be the X Factor here, also in the early game. Keep in mind that Sonya is a bit afraid of ETC at this point, just because he can always make sure that she's pushed back and doesn't really get as much aggression in as she wants to. Justin, also, with a bit of trouble here. We have 28 stacks already on the side of Team Dignitas. Roll20 trying to gain control 
control of the Shrine, but Greyman has taken a camp in the meantime and is now starting to pressure two lanes with the help of Abathur. Already Team Dignitas here with an Abathur composition very early on is winning the map objective, not losing an experience, winning in kills uh, on all fronts at this yeah. point in time. That is not what you want to see when a slug is on the other side of the battlefield. Exactly. So the usually weaker early game that we have in an Abathur composition completely negated by Dignitas rotations here already. And especially with Greyman continuously applying the pressure at the bot lane, Roll20 will have to react to this. They can't just simply bright wing against Greyman. This is a losing matchup for her. She can't really sustain that. And once that Greyman gets the structures at the bot lane, comboed with now what they get up at the top, Dignitas might walk away with a pretty solid experience. Here. Yeah, Dignitas will have that momentum. And again, before where you would normally assume with this style of composition. So Roll20, if they can hit the brakes here a little bit, it's most likely going to be with them trying to force a hard initiation, some kind of follow-up with that diablo Sonia synergy. Again, the Prismaticism Gul'dan pick that we felt like the lack of a hyper carry is making up for the lack of map control that Roll20 has. It's just, does it bring enough to the skirmishing and to the team fights? I feel in the end when we're talking about Gul'dan in particular and also about the damage, it really comes down once again to his heroic ability. It's the biggest argument in favor of Gul'dan and Roll20 really needs to use that to their advantage, get good horrifies in combo that with Diablos and Sonya's damage and try to just capitalize on it with kills. Yeah, it has been something that kind of rose to power once there, you know, Gul'dan came out, everybody was like, he's amazing with this macro, look at his ability to control the map, and then everybody saw the supports, the double support coming online, they are like, well, you have to stay clumped, you have to remain grouped, we can use that Horrify as a deterrent, but even with that, I feel like it is, you know, a bit, I don't want to say dated, but it does feel like it is out of flavor of the month, yeah. if you will, when it comes to the meta. Especially in the European scene, we see a lot of Gul'dan, so Dignitas is very well versed in using Gul'dan, Mina, one of the best Gul'dan players that we have on the European realm. But they're also, of course, extremely strong, realizing when Gul'dan is the strongest and trying to be prepared for that. So it's going to be interesting to see if Dignitas puts themselves into a position where the Horrify can really find the value. Yeah, I expect that they will be able to remain, you know, hesitant and patient with their positioning into those team fights. But Dignitas right now is in a huge power oh, swing. Yeah. They obviously are in the lead, but they're about to gain a lot more control. Oh, Brilliant invade here, too. And look at this. Goku actually trying to turn this around for the fight. That Pretend. might be a mistake. And there's the first kill. Bright being down as Glorang moves in, but this might not be the only one. Jay, once again, uh, whiffing a mosh pit here. That's already the third time for him today. Not his finest hour here, but they still get the two kills that they wanted. They kill Diablo, they kill Brightwing, they steal the camp away. And with the Shrine being active, they send the Auric back, but they still break through the wall up at the top. In Roll20, their heroics are nowhere to be found for a very long while here. This, without a doubt, is going to be Dignitas' ability to back out, pressure the map, paint it blue, pick up some of those mercs, and then use that Punisher on line on bottom. In this type of situation, they have two choices. You can hyper commit to the Punisher and try and siege and take advantage of the lack of 10 for roll 20, or you can go and be patient, be like, it's okay if they get their heroics. We're going to pressure top with the Shaman, mid with the camp, and the Punisher through bottom. And as we're talking about macro decisions overall, I really like what we just saw a second ago on the screen. All the uh, Toxic Nest, the Venom Nest that we are seeing from Mena across the map, he specced heavily with his Abathur into the Toxic Nest. Going in Venom Nest on level 1, Prolific Dispersal on level 4, and then also going into the Vile Nests on 7. So he's really just plastering all these small runs, trying to slow down opponents, getting the extra poke damage, and, and making sure that his team has also very good vision about rotations, which is absolutely crucial on this map. And things have been struggling here for Roll20, but this is going to be the opportunity for them to turn it around as they go for those heroics. Horrify was picked up for the Gul'dan, and Prismaticism, we've said it before, we now need to see it come online hit a massive AoE. The minimum target here has to be Rhaegar. You need to make sure that the support does not have the opportunity to hit the Ancestral onto that kill target. Also, we have Lightning Breath taken on the side of Diablo. Now, typically on this map, we see more Apocalypse, especially from Roll20 in the past with their Medivh combos to set that up. But of course, when you're talking about Infernal Shrines, Lightning Breath gains a lot of value when you are trying to take the position on the Shrines themselves and try to win the objective. 
And roll 20 isn't a bit of a pickle. It's not only that we lost another keep on their side, sorry, another fort, but also losing the wall up at the top makes the next Punisher that spawns top lane, the next temple, so much stronger against them. So this is really something that you need to be worried about. They can't bait the Punisher over the wall anymore to put some extra damage on it. This one will walk straight onto the keep. And we can see that Dignitas, wait a minute, it's got to get the collapse here with the 13 talents here. Oh. Jay goes in for the mosh pit, but it gets horrified. Once again, the horrify here, and then immediately JPL in a little bit of trouble with the Ancestor comes through the lightning breath to use by Diablo. We are seeing the spin to win from Sonya as the Divine Shield has hit her and she's trying to go for it. Main is about to lose the copy on Greyman. No deaths thus far, but once again, Zelia is moving into the fire. It's Leoric. Goku goes in. He's hacking and slashing onto Zelia and he's going to find... No, oh not the kill. God. Bakery saving the day once again. Justin goes in. Going to overpower. Flip it on in. Polymorph down and Snitch is out of here. Snitch is down. Roll 20. They get their camp. The 13 versus 10 fight in Talons ends in favor of Roll20. Great fight by them, and especially that Horrified did everything it needed to. Jay wanted to go for the Mosh Pit, and that would have been a devastating heroic to be used there, but Gul'dan was ready. Roll20 shows signs of life here, but by no means have they reeled themselves back to even footing. Down the 13 talent here, Abathur, it's sad to say, is just now hit the moment where he is going to be those problems. He's hit the later stages of the game where death timers really grow out here. So Roll20 needs to find a way to gain structural control. They need to open up that middle lane specifically. So after, you know, he can't get that dance in the rotations here for Dig would be a smidge slower as we have 10 more seconds on that shrine. And even with Snitch dying in the last fight, I have to say that the supports on the side of Team Dignitas with Abatha, with Rega, did an amazing job to keep a lot of these targets alive. I saw several of them already dying, and then they barely just got that last second shield that allowed them to escape back to safety. Yeah, and I, I want to highlight Lauren's kiting in the last skirmish as well. I feel like he did a very good job on that squishy, squishy Brightwing of getting the kite and cycling around. But as we see, Roll20 posturing all four members onto the shrine, gaining a lot of the skeletal defenders, but Dignitas is not interested, only centering JPL and Bakery up here, and they're focusing on that bottom key. Yeah, they're going straight for their keep, and only Gul'dan is there to save them, and in the meantime, Bakery and JPL are still posturing around on the shrine, threatening them here. The two-level lead for Dignitas is solid. Mane committed to the copy here as well on the Avatar ult, but they have not gotten the key, but it is incredibly low. That was a very good rotation for Team Dignitas. Yes, they did forfeit the map objective, but early Punishers are not very, very good. They're just team fight focused objectives. So to get that much damage onto a keep is really going to prime them up to get the catapult pressure very easily after this. Dignitas is fighting for it right now. They don't have the talent advantage. They need to be careful what they do here. Here comes the Lightning Breath once again, but Jay already moved back out. Jay on the way back. 36. And we have 36 to 36. Roll 20 tries to commit to it, but which team is going to get it? 39. It looks like Roll 20 got the Punisher. Polymorph dropped, and Zalia is going to go into Ghost form. Big problem now at the same time as though Abathur at the bot lane. Oh yes, he'll be able to help with that experience, make sure lock in the 20, and then that keep we were talking about that was primed and ready. Glorong is the man to respond back here. He'll have the teleport in case something happens at mid. And exactly in the mid lane, here's the bait over the wall. Already the defense started, but look at Justin. He's trying to flank here, he's trying to go in. He doesn't get the flip though, doesn't get the overpower here, but he pushes Team Dignitas back and makes sure that Roll20 can easily claim the fort. Very good restraint here from Team Dignitas after losing Zaldia and just sacrificing some of the opportunities on that middle fort, staying very far back, and now they'll be able to lock in the 16. And Roll20, I'm surprised they're still sieging. Dignitas wants this fight. Yeah, at this point, Dignitas has the talent lead, and they're already trying to go for it. Royal Focus has now been picked up by Leoric as he's starting to move in. Justin is in trouble. He tries to go for the Lightning Breath, but he goes down, and that's his soul's gone. And we are not done yet as Goku is chased, and so is Prismatis' man. But down goes Gul'dan, and we have barely an escape on the side of Sonya, but it looks like Butts might not be that lucky. She didn't escape. She's getting mounted up there. She's able to kite around very effectively, so good job there by the Peekaboo coming out from Gloron. Got the reveal, but with those kills, they Team Dignitas, this is going to be a very easy keep up on bottom. They can't fight this. There's still no 16 for all 20. They're down one member. They have to give that up and immediately then move back in. But there's the one other thing that I actually want to point out when we're talking about talents. We haven't really mentioned too much since most of the builds are pretty standard, but I want to point out the level 13 talent on ETC. We have Face Smelt taken over Mic Check, which is something 
that at least in Europe you don't see all that often. With the extra slow that we have now after the face melt, it's definitely an interesting choice, but normally what most European pros at least will highlight is the synergy between the level 4 talent and mic check on 13 that allows you to get the cooldown reduction here. So Jay going for down a little bit of a different route here with his ETC play. And the one thing that I'm looking for from the members of Roll20 is now that they have the 16, how are they going to stop this pressure up on bottom? Because even in that last fight, Glorong didn't want to commit to it to be able to try and get the peel. The members of Roll20 sieging up onto that front wall was a very high risk decision as I tried to highlight a little bit before and on that note it does feel like that is when we talk about North America and we look at North America and we say a better team would maybe punish them for some of the decision making how long did Zalia hesitate before getting that initiation the minute yeah. he locked in 16 he's like well we're Wraith walking in because we know this is the battle we want yeah, and at this point, the, it's not only the pressure at the bot lane that we have with the catapults, but you also have now to deal not only with bot lane, Abatha is going to try and siege up at that top lane later on. And talking about the top lane, the Shrine is activating, and we've mentioned earlier that that wall at the top keep on the side of Roll20 has been destroyed by Dignitas early on when they were able to push through as they stole the Shaman camp. So if Dignitas claims the objective, Roll20 is very likely to lose another keep. Now, of course, Dignitas finds himself in that spot where they are on 18 against 16. This is the best time for Roll20 to take a fight since they are on even talents. Dignitas would love to stall that out. They are posturing around at the bot lane, actually, and are going to try and threaten core. And let's keep in mind, we have a double Greyman on their side. I'm trying to question, is this the core? It is going to be the core. Rather than just going for Glorong and looking for a pick, the members of Roll20 now starting the channel to make the back. Zalia, he's scouting out, seeing if he can get the interrupt. And now Dignitas, they see a couple of the members way back home. To try to take the drawback. This is brilliant play from Dignitas again on that macro level. They can continue to do that all day long. With if you have a double gray main on the core, those points fall fast. And that's something that Roll20 has to respect. But in the meantime, we have Zelia at the top lane, and Abatha can just jump between the two lanes and say, as long as I don't commit to my ult, we can do whatever we want here. But right now the rotation up has started. Right, we still at the bot lane, 14 versus 14 stacks. Prismat is making the transition to top, but Dignitas might be able to cut him off. That was a very scary moment. Buds even pulls still out is. to try and... Yeah, look at this choke. Dignitas has split all the members of Roll20. This is worst case scenario for Roll20. Jay is trying to capitalize on it. He's trying to go in, and he drops once again. The watchman that gets immediately interrupted, but we already have the Royal Focus on the Ominous Wrath. Used by Leoric to try and reduce the damage output of Roll20. Roll20 trying to get together, and we have the copy on Rega going for Prismatis in the back line, but Gul'dan survives. The fight on the Shrine, on the other hand, is yielding his first victim as Brightwing is down, and she might not be the only one. Goku is low, and Dignitas is ready for the chase. Justin goes in to try and get a little bit of peel. Rave walk in, the mine is hit. Goku is not long for this world. Bud's going into ghost form. Yeah, we even see Diablo going down here. Team Dignitas is just dominating on this map. Leoric with a maze to the face, dropping Sonya, and now the only survivor is Gul'dan, and we have Team Dignitas going through the small wall in the mid lane. They want to go for core here. It's only Gul'dan. He already used his Horrify, and we have on the side of Team Dignitas level 20, and every single player is up as they are going for the core to gain victory over Roll20 in game number one of the best of three series in the winners matching Group C. Dignitas taking the lead against Roll20 on Inferno Shrines. Really impressive play coming out from Team Dignitas again in the very first series that we saw them perform today against Tempest. They were a lot of focus and concentration went on to how can we make them worry about their core. It had, you know, some highlights and some lowlights in the very first series, but against Roll20, it seems like it was just untouchable. Yeah, Roll20, they struggled very much in the early game. They had a bit of a phase during the mid game where it looked for a few moments, okay, are they coming back into this? And I feel like the 18 versus 16 scenario was something that Dignitas got worried about slightly, since if you lose a team fight, you lose the objective, all of a sudden that snowball potential. Four roll 20 is there, but they dealt very well with it using the macro advantages that they have to control the battleground. And I just want to bring up again on that very last team fight, the splitting of the members of Roll20 and forcing that initiation for Dignitas really felt like it was the nail in the coffin. Not even beyond the fact that there was Abathur clone onto the Rhaegar single-handedly was 1v1ing Prismaticism. It forced a Horrify in every cooldown he had. So that was 
just amazing capitalizing on the mispositioning here of Roll20. Forcing Gul'dan back and then trying to cut him off from the rest of the team, really splitting Roll20 was crucial here. And I'm sure that our analysts have way more to say about this first game in our winner's match, so we're back to Polaris and the desk. Indeed, a good start for Team Dignitas here for the series. But I want to highlight something that's very interesting about today compared to every other day is that so far, I think what we've seen more so now is very technical play from almost every single one of our teams so far, Gilead. Yes, this is a, an extremely strategic day. And a lot of that is coming down to Dignitas and how they're playing, how they're able to open up a win condition so early on and abuse the fear of losing the game to get a checkmate position either way. Either... Mm. Uh, they defended their core there, or they got the Shrine, but either way, uh, Dignitas were going to get a victory somewhere. Yeah, it just feels like they've run this type of scenario countless times, like thousands and thousands of times. Grubby and I were talking about the mine positioning, example, to stop flankers. We saw many clone to push the keep, for example. Mine positioning always stopping members from coming over to punish those, uh, you know, really aggressive bot lane pushes. You have Leoric at the top to stop potential hearts. Makes it frustrating for Roll20 to deal with potentially a core call, which I don't think ever was really the plan. And it's just the most patient, the most macro play I think we've ever really seen in this tournament. And I think Dignitas, if no one can figure out how to beat this, will go very far. I mean, we're not out of this yet or anything like that, but I don't know if Roll20 is going to be able to adapt to this in this best of three. I don't think they can. I mean, it looks very good what Dignitas is doing, right? And for what it's worth, Roll20 does have... Um, the mentality to counter it, they were very aware of the threat, especially the multi-layered threat, mm. threatening core, not really going, but having the potential to actually go if they're not ready. It's just that they didn't seem able to be ever on even footing in terms of level. I actually just want to take another look at that final moment there, uh, that final battle. As we take a look here, as we just pause it for a sec, Mene copies on the Rhaegar. Of course, this is a surprise attack. Brightwing is not available yet and now needs to make a very difficult decision who to port into. And everyone is getting hammered at the same time. Gul'dan cannot use his Horrify as we roll it forward slowly. He completely has to fend for himself. Now, if Brightwing helps Gul'dan, that's an easier win there, but then there's no Emerald Wind available in the fight proper. And there's just no combo ability here for, uh, for, for Roll20 here. And it just reminds me of this old quote from Sun Tzu's Art of War, win the fight before even starting it, paraphrase. Because Roll20 is all over the place. And this mm -hmm. is a direct result from the button pressing that Dignitas has done, the divide and conquer strategy. And it's just wonderful to have won the fight before it even begins. Not only strategical ingenuity uh, in the execution, but also just Menes Abatha in general. We didn't get to see much of his Abatha at all. And ever, because Snitch would normally be running that, but this time around, Manny was uh, a very, very big playmaker here. Any global that Dig has has been a big playmaker here, whether Mene is on Falstad or Abathur, or we have Zaley as Dahaka. And what is happening is Dig is getting so much of a lead, then they just run over the map, and they use that global, and that's a big part of the fear factor that their opponents are having to deal with. Roll20's composition came online later and later. With, with Diablo, you're looking at 1316. With Sonya later and later, I would like to see the next draft be something that's a little bit earlier so that they can make sure that they're being aggressive when they need to. Is, is there also a fear here for other teams going up against Team Dignitas where when Abatha comes out that early in a draft, because you've got someone like Mene who now, he only played once in Phase 2, I believe, but then you've got someone like Snitch who can quite easily go onto that. This makes their comps in draft a little bit more unpredictable. Yeah, it makes their drafts unpredictable. There's so many different ways they can do this. We've seen them do the Falstad, we've seen Abatha, we've seen Dahaka. I feel like one way you could do, but it doesn't necessarily play into Roll20 strengths, is ban globals and pick globals early. But try to remove all the tools that Dignitas has to play this style, then try to beat them with those tools in team fights, which is not easy. But if you remove those kind of global macro tools, it's tough to draft that way. It's very obvious when Roll20 starts drafting the way what they're doing, but Plus, I think that might be their best bet. Then you're playing Dignitas's game plan. Yeah. Right. And, and and you can very much see Roll20 would like to be playing their own game plan. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what's the correct choice, right? It's tough. You know, 